J. Allen St. John. Uh, not because I have any particular expertise, but I do I have a look at a website of bios of artists, popartists.com. So I have just done uh, research on this particular artist and like 200 other guys. <laughs> So, uh, tell me when we're ready. But there's a nice picture of him anyway. Oh. Yeah, so I just have to have enough light I can also read. Is that good? Yeah, I don't know. Can everyone see this? Yes. Why is it going through its own... Uh... <laughs> 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 oh my god, I think I explained it to him. Alright, go ahead. All right. Oh, this is David Saunders. Uh, <laughs> in honor of Burroughs, uh, Martian, and Martian series of cars, and can you tell us about J. Allen St. John, who's probably the uh, best known of the Tarzan art, uh, of the Burroughs artists over the years? It, sorry, technical. Is that tilted the way it's like? Because it's just where I'm sitting or something. He's an artist himself, so he's We've been we've been preparing this for hours and hours. I know. Yeah, that's a lot better than it's <laughs> worse. There you go. Oh, that's getting the idea. Well, wait, well, wait. You know what I think happened? I think this uh yeah, that's Peter, come up here and fold it. <laughs> Get some shins. Get some wooden shins and beat them. There you go. There's all there. There's all there. I'm really the other one. Yeah. 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 James Allen St. John, and you know, he's always associated uh, with his Tarzan stuff, so uh, these are some of his wacky signatures. And that's the famous guy sitting there right next to a beautiful Tarzan painting. This is the next one. So that's the painting, you know, that he's sitting in front of. This is the next one. So this is the way in which a lot of people first saw. J. Allen St. John, you know, that's how he's associated, and that's what they think of. And it's just a great uh, way to first experience it, you know, just in these beautiful old quality prints. So it's a nice baby there. Okay, so this is the guy he's always, uh, you know, <laughs> associated with. And I just found this kind of weird photograph of him uh, with his wife of Lawrence Gilbert. And uh, in 1938, you know, fashion magazine or something. And um, uh, so, uh, oddly enough, uh, she was the uh, former wife of the serial uh, New Adventures of Tarzan, which had been made a couple of years before that photograph. Anyway, so that's uh, for us. And this is partly why we're thinking about it so much for the anniversary, the Clinton PT. Um, cover from All Story a hundred years ago. But anyway, so that's uh, just a little background, but uh, next slide, please. But uh, the question tonight really is, who is this guy, James Allen St. John? So here's this funny cute picture of him. Are you all familiar with that picture by any chance? Or? Okay. Uh, he was born in Chicago, October 1st, yeah, 1872. So actually, that's 140 years ago, just doing the math. Um, and when the Clinton PT thing came out, he was already 40 years old. Just to think about it. Not that he had anything to do with it, but it's just like, he's not like most folk artists in the sense of, you know, um, a child of depression or something like that. I mean, he's, um, you know, a child, uh, basically, a, a post-Civil War. Anyway, um, we all know him as J. Allen St. John, but he was known throughout his whole life just as Jim. <laughs> Which is kind of surprising. Um, 
His father was Dr. Josephus Allen St. John, who's actually kind of well-to-do. He was born in 1831 in East Hubbardston, Vermont. And that family, his dad's family, with him as a kid, well, no, just his, his family moved to Wisconsin in Janesville, Wisconsin, in 1837. And they were among the first people ever to settle there as farmers. And so that's his actual grandfather, whose name was Levi St. John. And they uh, worked the land, and uh, but they were able to send their... Um, youngest son, Josephus, to college, and he became uh, an allopathic medicine and a physician. And so that's kind of interesting that J. Allen St. John's dad was a, um, had that interesting little background as a settler and as a uh, farmer, and then as a, a becoming a doctor. And um, so the artist J. Allen St. John is shown here with his mother, uh, Susan Healy, H-E-L-Y, um, she was born in 1834 in Ireland, and her father was a portrait painter named Hilliard Healy. He was born in 1800, and he actually studied at Dublin's Trinity College, which is kind of not easy to do at all. So that indicates that he was a um, prosperous, well-to-do, educated man. And they came to America in 1837, and they, they moved out and settled in Janesville, Wisconsin. Same time. And so, uh, her father then was a farmer there, but he actually, you know, raised a family and also painted portraits of people. So I don't know what you would actually call that. Um, but it's kind of interesting. So, uh, he taught his daughter how to paint portraits, and she always wanted to uh, get academic training like he did in, in Dublin. And probably the teachers he had in Dublin were from Paris or whatever. Uh, so this is something in her mind and stuff. Her um, older brother named uh, George Healy married a girl in town, this tiny little farm town, Janesville, named Eliza St. John. And um, that's the sister of um, J. Allen St. John, father, Josephus, anyway. So they actually both got married uh, in the same year, 1859. So it's kind of interesting, these uh, two different families, um, both of them actually educated, in a sense, as uh, uh, pioneers, settlers, uh, for whatever hardships drove them there, probably part of American history. And um, within the family, uh, a son and daughter and a son and daughter uh, both married each other and had formed a kind of an interesting um, um, support group, I guess, around J. Allen St. John when he was growing up. Now, the, the father, um, Dr. Josephus, um, moved to Chicago in 1870, and they lived at uh, 311 22nd Street. Doug, do you know where that is? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a pretty nice little brownstone type of thing, because he opened a, um, uh, a doctor's office there. And, of course, while he was there, um, his wife in this picture here, was able then to go to the Art Institute and get her first formal training after having been trained by her father, just as, uh, within the family kind of thing. So she got really into it and studied there and then uh, had the baby. And um, she was an incredible free spirit. And uh, if you imagine it, 1870, is actually, you know, Susan B. Anthony and all that stuff, too. So it's kind of an interesting thing. You've got these uh, educated people uh, in the Midwest, and uh, this woman uh, has a definite artistic um, ambitions, uh, his mother. And um, it's just kind of neat that there was this um, uh, a different way of doing things, apparently, in his family, which was uh, not 
not uh, that conventional. And she uh, brought two of the art students from the school to live at the house that they had. So she was there with two other young students, women artist students. So uh, you can imagine the, the father is like, you know, working and running this uh, medical practice. And uh, his, you know, young, beautiful wife uh, has always wanted to be an artist and is now studying to be an artist. And then she brings artists home to live in the house with them. And this is the world in which, you know, uh, this little two-year-old kid is growing up and deciding he wants to be an artist also. So it's kind of strange. And um, one of his quotes from J. Allen St. John, is, uh, or Jim as we know him now, is, um, my first recollections are of my mother's art studio and the magic way the eyes of her portraits followed me as I walked about the place. And uh, he also goes on to talk about how she brought a bohemian crowd of people around her at all times. Okay, so uh, he's born in 1872. In 1880, at the age of eight, his mother left his father, probably with their permission and everything and funding, and she went to study in Paris, which is kind of like her dream. And of course, that's what all American artists were supposed to do. They were actually required to do, practically. You couldn't even have a career if you didn't study in Paris. They would say, well, where did you study? You could say Chicago or Pennsylvania Academy, and they'd say, that's it? And say, well, you know, you really are nothing unless you at least have one year or three years in Paris. So she went to do basically her graduate level work after Chicago, and she brought him with her. And um, so uh, at the age of eight, he was living in Paris just with her for three years. And um, he claimed later that his visits to the great museums like the Louvre confirmed his interest in becoming a painter. And so it's kind of cute that we have this picture of him. Can we look at another picture? Yeah. So that's 1880. This is 1895. Um, anyway, so uh, he returns to America in 1883. So they had the three years for her to finish her work. And she decided she wanted to continue her studies at the National Academy of Design in New York City. And so that was another great school, too. The father, in ever faithfulness, closed down his practice in Chicago and bought a townhouse in New York City and started a new medical practice there. And while he was doing that, the, the kid, you know, 11 years old, started going to public school. Um, and at that time, uh, most people only went to public school until the age of 13. It was very unusual to go beyond that, um, unless you were maybe going to go to college or something, and you want then have like prep type school. It was less than, uh, I think, 3% or 6% of people in America ever graduated high school at that time. Um, so in, um, she also began to do portraits of people then, uh, wealthy people in New York City at that time. And, uh, but in 1888, um, after finishing the eighth grade, J. Allen St. John's uh, quit school, which was normal. And, uh, he did not want to enter the uh, workforce, and his father tried to oh, to buy for him uh, like an export-import company, uh, and said that you know he would fund him and get a, a partner he would go into work with who was an experienced adult. This almost reminds me of Citizen Kane or something like that, like the way that uh, he's so flippant about starting businesses and stuff. But he's just he said he, he just totally bristles at it, and so they're squabbling, and. Um, now this interesting earlier marriage comes into play of uh, his mother's older brother and his father's old, older sister, um, because that guy, his uncle and aunt, George Healy and Aunt Eliza St. John Healy, have uh, became really good farmers and made a ton of money, moved out to California and started a 2,000 acre farm with livestock and grain and very, very successful. And so it was probably one of those deals where, um, you know, he said, well, I'm going to go live with my uncle for a while. And they had three children. Uh, there were three boys that were his age. And so, um, you know, go live with the cousins. And uh, so it was almost like a very, very close um, family group. So he left uh, everything and went out to goof around on this ranch at the age of 16, which is in... Um, San Joaquin Valley, Southern California. 
forgive my mispronunciation. Um, while he was out there, he bumped into this guy, Eugene Torrey, who had gone to school with his mother at the, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And he was a landscape painter in Los Angeles. But he began to work with him, and they together um, were going around painting landscapes. And uh, his rich uncle was buying them and stuff like that. So it's kind of an interesting thing. This is all the young J. Allen St. John. So at the age of 19, he did three years out there. He returns to New York City, and this is him uh, studying at William Merritt Chase um, painting class at the Art Students League in New York City. And uh, see, I don't have like a pointer or something, but it's perfectly easy for me to do here. <laughs> this is him here. And who this little naked kid is, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, they're artists, so let's not be judgmental. <laughs> but that would indicate that this is a private um, class that they've hired their own model and they took a photograph of it. So it's probably a little club within the Art Students League. Um, and uh, like uh, Eugene Franzen, uh, another great pulp uh, illustrator, belonged to the club, private club at the Art Students League also uh, 30 years later. But anyway, so they had these weird little clubs. So that's probably what that's all about. Um, at this, a couple years after this photograph, he's uh, selling illustrations to the New York Herald. This is a self-portrait he did in the class. Next, please. So here's one of those little illustrations, and uh, it's you know I would say it's mediocre. It's interesting. It's not something that would drive you crazy. I don't think. So it's kind of interesting that he didn't start out drawing uh, uh, earth-shattering things. But, um, you know, he had good training, and uh, this is uh, what they call journeyman artist type of tasks. So he was working for several years in New York City newspapers, and also got some jobs illustrating uh, two novels, uh, just doing the interiors for the novels. Um, but he also got some... Uh, uh, portrait jobs. Um, then in two, 1901, his parents moved back to Chicago. And that left him alone. I think the next one. And so he had to start his own uh, space. He couldn't just live at his parents' house anymore. And um, he's now uh, you know, officially um, almost 20 years old. So, uh, But his dad funded him. Uh, go back, please. So this is uh, the letterhead for his paper at that time. It's just, uh, you can see it kind of modern, turn of the century. Uh, but it's, that's a portrait of him. It's his address in New York City, and that's his little art studio. And that was, this was on his stationery that he wrote to people. So you can see a sense of like a proprietor starting a business very proud of himself, and rightly so. And uh, so 393 um, 8th Avenue is on 30th Street, which is just two blocks below the famous uh, Pennsylvania Station which was a hubbub of activity at that time. Um, now, in 1903, his dad is out in Chicago, and he becomes uh, mortally ill. And uh, uh, he was uh, 71 years old at that time. And so right away, uh, to help his mom to take care of his dad, because uh, his mom, I think, was like not a fully responsible adult, perhaps. She was more like a bohemian or something. And so he closed his studio and went back, and he and she monitored the care of the father. And so, uh, let's look at the next one anyway. So then the, his father died April 19, 1904, at the age of 72 in Chicago. So and that's why he was drawn back out to Chicago and, um, you know, had this interesting childhood in all these different places, you know, uh, in California and Paris and New York City and then Chicago and also starting out in Janesville on the farm and everything. Anyway, um, so he began to do commercial work in the mid in Chicago at that time for publishers, books, and newspapers and magazines out there. So he was trying to try and continue his own career that he was doing. And uh, let's look at the next one. So these are these are those deals. That's still in New York. Please, next one. That's his cool art studio. So this was his first big break. Hold it there for a second. So this is uh, uh, the face.
space in the pool, um, the cover for the book, uh, which is the publishing company, uh, is almost more important in his life. This is McClure, uh, which he then had a very long uh, relationship with for the rest of his, uh, you know, for most of his career. Um, so uh, this was quite well uh, advertised and sold well, and it was in other magazines and articles, and uh, there was ads for it everywhere. So it really helped to promote his who he was. And if he hadn't done this, it probably wouldn't have had his relationship with McClure later on doing the, the Tarzan things. So um, while he's there, at this time he meets Mary Ann Munger. And uh, he was going to take a, a, a typing lesson at a secretarial school. And uh, she was working there. And uh, that's how they met. She was born in Chicago, July, tw July 21st, uh, 1884. So that means she's uh, 12 years younger than him. So she was probably, uh, uh, what, I shouldn't say that. But uh, they were um, an interesting couple, probably. Uh, and they married on uh, November 11th, 1905. So it's right around the time of this deal. Um, now, so they, they start goofing around. They're making some work. Uh, he's doing OK. And then they decide to go back to Paris, just like his mom. And he's going to get now his final training in Paris, which is, again, normal. Um, N.C. Wyeth was like, uh, you know, study with Howard Pyle at around this time. And uh, Pyle was the only person in the United States, practically, that said, don't go to Paris. Don't study. Let's be American artists. Forget about uh, European classicism. Let's find American art. Look within ourselves. Look within our landscapes. Try to find something here that has more meaning than just simply imitating the Parisians. And so uh, it's, he was bucking the system uh, when he said that and, and of course, had a, a very radical impact on American art. But 99% um, of the people who wanted to be artists had to go to Paris. And so he went to Paris for two years with his wife. Uh, um, so then uh, they came back in 1910, I don't know if there's another slide or not for that, and, uh, no, that's not yet, hold on, yeah, that's okay, move that picture. <laughs> they came back in 1910, and they were living with his mother, who was a widow at that time, in this townhouse, living kind of off of his parent, his father's inheritance, basically, and uh, then his mother dies in 1913, and she was at that time 79 years old. So it's kind of interesting, before we've even seen, the, oh, you can do the next slide, yeah. Before we've even seen the real uh, J. Allen St. John, he's gone through the tragedy of having lost uh, this great inspired figure in his life, his, his mother, who, uh, you know, has passed away. And so he's got, uh, between then and, and this painting, uh, this is 1913, you know, when she died. And so um, it's just kind of interesting to think that um, that's the background that this guy came from. So they moved into this weird uh, three-story building called the Tree Studio in Chicago, which is on uh, 3 East Ontario Street, where they lived for the rest of their lives. And it's this weird place that some modern architect designed that has like artist living spaces and artist studios all to grind. And he had the first floor, which also had this garden in the background, in the backyard. And uh, so it, he was really quite uh, interestingly positioned in a way because, uh, you know, uh, his father was a social figure as a doctor there. And his mother had been going to school, basically in the art school, for like 25 years or something. Uh, of their of his his whole childhood practically and so the, he knew everyone in the art world there and many of the wealthy people that came to have portraits painted by his mother and that type of thing so it's kind of an interesting thing that's right happening while he's doing this and um, uh, so let's see what's next here okay so this is the NC Wyeth cover um, uh, for the return of Tarzan um, uh, which uh, I believe in 1913 appeared in New Story uh, in three three installments, and uh, um, this is reprinted by McClure. So McClure has a deal like we're going to make these books, and but uh, they hired uh, J. Allen St. John to do all the interior headings uh, for the thing. So 
This is his first uh, Tarzan um, or Jay, uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs project in a way, um, but he didn't do the cover. But I, I hope you've heard the funny story though about uh, uh, this paint, uh, not this painting, but because uh, it was a three-part series. Uh, but the first of the three paintings um, is by N.C. Wyeth, also from the New Story, and uh, so this is part three, uh, like two, three, two months later. But um, Burroughs uh, writes a letter saying, "Yeah, I, I kind of quite like that uh, cover." I'm paraphrasing it, and um, I think I'd like to buy that. So um, ask the artist how much for it or something. So N.C. Wyeth wrote back and said, $100, you can have this, not this, this is the earlier one, the, the two issues earlier, of the two men on the desert. And um, so Burroughs writes back this really, I think, very snotty uh, <laughs> things. He says, like, um, uh, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, Mr. Wyeth seems to like this painting a little more than I do. And uh, perhaps I'll be the generous one and allow him to keep it. <laughs> Very snotty. They wouldn't pay a hundred bucks for it. Uh, but um, uh, eventually, I think in 1960 or something, uh, uh, his son uh, bought this for the uh, uh, Burroughs estate, actually. This actual painting, which was from two issues later. Anyway, it's just a funny joke. Uh, next one. So this actually is his first cover uh, that he did, uh, J. Allen St. John, that appeared um, you know, on a book. And this is the stuff for which he's best known. Uh, what, can I just ask? What, yeah. The Cave Girl yeah. painting, that was by St. John? Yes. That was from 1913. Was that for a magazine? Or? I don't know. No? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it looked like a book. Actually. Yeah, it does look like a book. I think it appeared on the book later, right? But. I mean, the book did, uh, I, I don't, anyway, that's the guy we know right there. The magazine came out in 13, the book came out later. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he didn't do the magazine. Wasn't that the book that's there? Wasn't that St. John earlier? Yeah, it was. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't really date it. Sorry. Okay. I'm just not the brainiac, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, The Beast of Tarzan is his first one. Um, in 1917, he began also teaching at the Art Institute, uh, uh, which is normal for a lot of uh, uh, talented students that actually have a successful career because he keeps making these things. Next. In 1917 is also uh, the year of the war. So uh, I think it was a, a officially declared in 1918 and ended in November. 1919, but no one really knows when it ended or something. Yeah. 1919. But it actually didn't. I mean, hostilities didn't end until June the following uh, year, but so it's a little yeah. fucked up. Excuse me. It's a little <laughs> confusing. <laughs> Snafu, full butter. Uh, so we're jumping ahead too far there. Okay. Yeah. But he kept teaching. Oh, so anyway, this is. Anyway, go ahead and just go ahead. What would you want to be? I don't know. Go ahead. I thought we were talking about World War One. Yeah, we're, it's oh, good. Well, that's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> this is some of the other stuff that we don't normally associate with him anyway. I don't. So here he is working again for uh, Red Book, I think Green Book and Blue Book. <laughs> uh, is some more pictures here. Beautiful. So he's actually teaching and becoming kind of uh, popular as a guy because these books are really soaring. Everyone's going crazy over them. So uh, like students are just cramming to try and get into his classes and stuff like that by the mid-20s. Plus, he's, his work is appearing in, in major magazines. Uh, <clears throat> there's the chessmen we were talking about before. Isn't that beautiful? So here's something we don't see, like the Rotarian. Uh, but you can recognize it's got all the same energy in it, you know. <clears throat> so 
So one of the things he, he was doing was, uh, uh, along with teaching at the Art in, uh, Students League, he got a, uh, there was this thing, it was, a, again, a journeyman's club. It was called the uh, uh, Chicago uh, Businessmen's Art Association. And these were guys that, you know, uh, work uh, doing newspaper advertising and uh, just cartoons and newspapers or whatever. And they get together to form uh, art groups. And uh, there's little art clubs in practically every city. But sometimes the guys that they want to separate themselves from what they call Sunday painters. And let's just hold here for a second. So for uh, in 1926, 27, 28, and 29, he was affiliated with this weird uh, little-known private club. And this way the guys that were all working together in print shops at different... I mean, Chicago is a massive uh, center for uh, publishing. Um, very large, I want to say, it. but uh, they had so many uh, presses and uh, advertising agencies and publishers and stuff. So this was all these guys from there that were professionals, um, and they wanted basically to be able to uh, pal around, get drunk, uh, go out with other artists on weekends and paint, uh, and they called them picnic uh, sketching trips, and also to have hire a nude model so that you could all work together. Um, that's something that goes on uh, in every city in the world, uh, that there's artist clubs like that. So this is one. And um, we, we found this funny footage. Uh, I'd like to be able to show it now if we can. So uh, uh, I was researching a different artist and, uh, and a different club in uh, Chicago, and they had this footage in the basement, and they didn't know what it was. And, um, or when it was, because it, it just has, uh, sound film just has little uh, subtitles in it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, all right. It's looking very black right now. I'm sure that's some consolation to you all. <laughs> oh, please stand by. So anyway, so it's a it's a fun little footage that they made um, at this one private art club, and um, uh, then they were showing it around at different clubs, like, hey, what do we do with it? And uh, I guess the club went out of business, and the film was just left over at this other club's basement, and um, they didn't know what it was. So it was kind of fun. I mean, the archivist there knew it was uh, J. Allen St. John, it says his name, but he didn't know uh, much beyond that. And so um, it, it shows all types of other junk, like how to... Uh, do a etching ground for a copper plate and stuff like that. So it's I had to edit it to take out the the footage that's um, not related to him. But uh, you know, it, it's interesting. It shows his little painting class. How did you find it? Keep talking. How did How did you find it, Dave? Well, it was uh, I was researching uh, uh, this other art club in Chicago. Uh, Sometimes I'm tracking people down, and uh, one of the ways, I, I document artists, and so the artist I was looking for belonged to this other club. And um, if you go to the clubs that they belong to, sometimes they had membership photographs. And so one of the, the fun things to find is an actual picture, because you'd be surprised um, how many famous artists, there's never been a photograph taken of them, um, that you and I know from Pulp World, but... Uh, it, no one else has ever kept their pictures, so it's that's one of the hardest things to find. So I've, I've tried to get pally wally with a lot of uh, club librarians to see if they would, uh, you know, help me dig through stuff and find old photographs. Um, if this doesn't spoil what's coming up in the future in your talk here, well, I wouldn't know that. Well, but I just wanted. I seem to remember. All right. Uh, oh, oh wait, here we go. Sorry, Tony. Hold it. Uh, well, nothing much to say here, but that's J. Allen St. John standing up there, walking around. 
It's only two minutes, so, you know, don't blink. You know what? The first part was missing. Did you? You didn't hit the edited one. I think this is the unedited one. <laughs> so these are these old. No, we get to the part where we're making the top of the plate. Yeah, I know. It's just going to happen now. I'm afraid. The part of the top. Yeah, this is not the edited one. All right, so we can watch this for a little while here. You folks get the raw. Okay, you can still So do you recognize him at all? Yeah. It's pretty neat. You can really see his personality too. I don't want to um, spoil it for you by talking over it though. Why is he silent? See, he's saying that brush sucks. Throw it out. Get a fresh brush and don't hold it like this. Hold it like this. Talk. Make some important decisions. Don't just sit there noodling. Now, like this. Now, you notice his pinky is holding to keep a little distance. It's kind of nice. This is a clip to the second thing, which um, is the chalk group, which just means they're drawing um, with Conte from the nude. And um, this is a very good group of watercolor artist. I think he's doing a great job. So you're seeing the longer version now, luckily. I hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can see this is no spring chicken that's doing this watercolor thing here. So these are like guys that are probably been working since the Civil War in the newspapers in Chicago. This is what I cut out. <laughs> Here's an interesting thing, though. This one guy thinks it's like a still photograph. He's just sitting there smiling. <laughs> when they tell him, <laughs> and then he cracks up when he's relaxed, like, oh, yeah, I didn't notice a moving picture. Jeez. <laughs> now, this is great. This is Jay on St. John again. This is him sitting over here. And you can see they're all just goofing around. But in a minute you'll see how he's really the leader of the group. Okay guys, love that shit. I had the instructor criticizing me. Here. <laughs> All right, you can basically stop. Oh, this is cool. Do <laughs> <It's not that. laughs> you want to see it? All right, show of hands. You got it. Laying the ground. First, you start with the copper plate. You heat it lightly. Then take a rag, which is dumped into some etching ink, and dot it in three places. Burnish it slowly with a wax-held rosin bag. <laughs> when it's thoroughly rosined, <laughs> a minute from now. Oh, okay, no. Back to white. Now, I think you're now playing the edited version. Why don't you turn it off now? I think. All right, let's go back to the uh, yeah, 1928. Yeah. All right. Please bear with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Say something. You know, I write for Illustration Magazine, and uh, every now and then it comes up that uh, I've made some huge blunder in this thing that I've written. Like, I, you know, put a name in upside down or something. And I don't get a single letter from anyone complaining about it. And you realize that nobody reads anything. <laughs> they just look at the pictures. So when something's goofing up and he says, just talk a little bit, David. I'm used to that now, actually. <laughs> I'm just talking to myself here. All right, now he's going to flip forward to 1928. 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll go to the last one. Yeah, that one there. Okay. E exit. Now we're back into our talk. Get there. Full frame. Oh. Oh, that was good. Okay. So anyway, something happened around 1928, uh, 29, called the Great Depression and everything. Stock market crash. Everything changed. Everything uh, for newspapers and advertising and publishing. Everything changed. So everything that was familiar to them in that industry. You're doing the same thing again, man. No, it didn't work. I I got it to the right picture. It didn't work. And you don't think it'll happen again? It's okay. We'll get to it. I'll get there. Mm -hmm. You're enjoying the. <laughs> I specifically asked for a tech guy. Next. Dude, just press down. No, no. Just hit the square. Yeah, do that. Twenty-two times. You're cool. All right, that'll do it. It's all right. It'll work. 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 His whole world basically kind of crumbled, and everybody else's too. So everything that was established and popular uh, became, you know, unsettled and uh, had to reinvent itself after 1930. You know, because the old money system collapsed basically. So anyway, um, let's look at some next pictures. So he had to find new ways to. Uh, uh, proceed. So he's continuing to teach. He, he taught all the way up to the end of his life, but uh, suddenly, um, you know, he's working for Weird Tales, <laughs> and uh, something called the Boys World, and uh, just keep going. Yeah. And uh, Amazing Stories, uh, Fantastic Adventures, Magic Carpet, and uh, uh, you know, where we know and love him too. But, uh, yeah. So this was his uh, sound of the second half of his career. That was really the golden age up until uh, 1928 for him, pretty much, I guess. Um, in 1942, uh, he's 70 years old, so he's way too old to do anything. Um, you know, it, he was actually um, 26 in the Spanish-American War, so he was already too old then to be. I don't think there was a forced conscription in that uh, war. So, um, he never served, um, but he did what he could for, you know, the cause or whatever. Uh, and um, in the 40s and 50s, he continued to work for um, Amazing Stories, Fantastic Fate, Other Worlds, Mystic Magazine. And he, uh, in, in the very end, he began to teach at um, the Academy of Art, which is a different school in Chicago. And he died in Chicago at the age of 84 on May 23rd, 1957. Um, pretty, pretty amazing life. And uh, there's a great old picture of him uh, teaching at the academy at the end of his life. And this is a cool obituary uh, from the Janesville Daily uh, Gazette. And... Uh, it was a lot of the the the, the known stories of his life um, don't include uh, a lot of the aspects of his life story that I've just read to you. This is all chronicled from uh, archival research, um, you know, his his documents, and legal papers, and stuff. And so finding that obituary was very funny for me because it didn't jive at all with what I had uh, heard before was his life story. So it was interesting that the actual little town newspaper was exactly accurate with the information I had actually found. And that was one of the last things I found. So it was very strange that uh, a kind of a, a, an interesting thing that um, there's a lot of integrity comes out of uh, Janesville, Wisconsin, uh, including J. Allen St. John. Thank you very much. And I love taking the questions if you've got. I seem to remember from your excellent pulpartist.com website 
Uh, you were mentioning uh, some other pulp illustrators who had been students of St. John. Do you recall that they were? Students of his? Right. Oh, gosh. Who made it pulp I think Jerome Rosen might have been one of them. I'm not sure. I'm, I actually don't remember saying that, but uh, wow. I think some of you like, I just remember reading and going through some of the yeah. biographies that studied. So many of them studied, you know, with Harvey Dunn. Right. But, um, in New York, but, um, but I don't know the road the yeah, road. I mean, he's taught. He taught for, God, I think uh, almost like forty-five years or I, something I, in I, Chicago. I, so he must have taught everybody. I know that both of the Rosen brothers went to the Chicago. That's right, they did. Twenty-three, nineteen twenty-three, they were there. And he there though. Uh, he started in nineteen seventeen. He was actually teaching there. Yeah, so it it makes sense. Years. Does make sense. Yeah, that's right. Well, he was a celebrity. Uh, it, uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing that we, we have a huge separation in our mind between um, studying to be an illustrator and studying to be an artist. Uh, and that, that separation didn't really exist at that time. They still have made distinctions, but um, they're probably, he was probably the most famous artist teaching at the school, uh, however you look at it. So I think it's very likely that, I think it's a three year program at that time in Chicago. So. Um, I would think everyone tried to study with him at some point in the three years. And I would presume that Jerome, who of course was good enough that by a third year he was teaching. He was teaching there, there, yeah. In fact, one of his students was George. Right. And it's almost impossible, uh, a little bit, what I know from uh, teaching at art schools, that uh, you can't teach anywhere unless you uh, are very good friends with the guy who's the star there. So uh, <laughs> they undoubtedly knew each other, he could have been teaching there. Yeah. David. It is true, isn't it, that St. John redesigned the logo for Riverdale? That's bizarrely true, yeah. It's one of his uh, biggest legacies, but I didn't really want to bring it up because it's... Uh, it, it improved it so much. Yeah, yeah. So it was one of the weird things that he did uh, during the years, uh, I guess, 32, 33. Um, I suppose it's the only thing he ever did like that, isn't it? No, no, he was, uh, he did all the lettering on, on uh, all the Tarzan things, uh, all the girls, but he also did the lettering on, um, I think practically, uh, like the Rotarian, things like that. So he was, he was really, really, the, when they say journeyman, uh, and he spent, uh, you know, uh, six years in newspapers in Chicago and about four years in newspapers in New York, ten years at newspapers, that entirely means writing big sale. Macy's tomorrow, like that's how they did it, because they, they didn't they use farms. The idols and cars and whatnot to see the similarity. Yeah, the well, the, I know that he did the the, the heading, the heading titles, yeah. so the lettering on the headings. But I don't know that, uh, and um, they were not. And, and you know, uh, when he did illustrations for um, Weird Tales, he did, often did the lettering for them too, in the individual oh, stories. Oh, okay. And they didn't want him to, or ask him to, or pay him to. He would do it, because um, that's the kind of artist he was, I think, that he really enjoyed it. And no one else ever did that, you know, I don't think. Uh, among the other illustrators of his time, how popular was he with the general public? Do you have any sense? Of yeah, well, uh, the, the, the crazy thing about popularity with illustrators is that it's inseparable from the actual author. Uh, and so, or the product, you know, so it's like the guy who did, you know, um, the most famous tires illustration because everyone loved Firestone or whatever. That's like a very famous illustrator. So it's kind of funny, like an actor becomes very famous because he gets a great script and everyone loves that film. Um, it's kind of like, well, is Humphrey Bogart really, you know, or, or is, is the Maltese Falcon just such a great story? I mean, which, which comes first kind of thing. But anyway, uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' books were phenomenally, pheno it's a phenomenon, like a fad, like the Beatles or whatever. It's just every single person had to have those things and read them, and the numbers of sales were so high. So he was the visual equivalent, and so many, many, many people assumed that he was probably the greatest, but he wasn't, and he was, you know, not necessarily wealthy or anything like that. But it was enough to draw students to study with. Well, he was. That, that's a kind of. That's 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 what you get for celebrity. That's they don't. It wasn't like a trophy or anything. So, he was extremely famous and a household name in the sense because of that connection only. Though I think. Uh, just wanted to ask. You talked about how uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs kind of uh, blew up Wyatt. 
<laughs> insultingly. Um, I, I assume that uh, Burroughs was very fond of Jail and St. John's work. Uh, there's, I actually tried to get a, um, uh, a take on that because, you know, his letters have been poured over and uh, um, I have not been one of the poorers, but uh, everything he ever said or thought about every illustration, I think, is very well documented. Um, and so uh, there were a number of illustrators he disliked, and there were some illustrators he thought were really good, and there are many of them that he never made a comment about in any letter to an editor or anything like that. But look at that long series of work. That's that would you'd have to assume that he was happy with it, but he wasn't necessarily uh, as uh, micromanaging the illustrators that much, as far as I can see. Um, but do you, what do you know? No, I would you say I, Burroughs was? Uh, well, no, but I, I would just assume that Burroughs was such a phenomenon that he and his publishers must have at least recognize the commerciality. Well, I think one of the most telling things is that Frank Schoonover did covers, and N.C. Wyatt did covers, and maybe in the world of Burroughs, those are comparable names to J. Allen St. John, but not in the world of art. Those guys are, are gods of American art, and so those guys came before him. So no matter what he might have wanted to do, he was probably in some form or another at least uh, overawed that he was replacing these guys that were basically our greatest masters. How many Burroughs book covers did he do? I don't know. <laughs> A number. <laughs> John. Uh, St. John continues with McClure's after Burroughs parts biz, parts company, right? Yes. Uh, so he did, what, books by Cummings and whoever McClure tries to plug into the hole left when Burroughs leaves? I, I actually debated over bringing this up or not, um, and a friend of mine who I trust very much said I should bring it up, but um, I didn't. Um, but uh, I have no expertise on Edgar Rice Burroughs. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Steve? I, 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 I just wondered, what, how much, how much St. John stuff from McClure is there that's not Burroughs stuff? I guess Almost 50%. Whoa. Yeah. Did, did he continue to illustrate for Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated when they began publishing the book? No. 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 No, he did one or two. But then Burroughs didn't want to pay his, his price. So he, he had his son and his cousin do it. Telling his relatives to show up to study Burroughs. Steve? Uh, according to Daryl Richardson, he said, uh, that J. Allen St. John depicted Tarza better than any other artist, and it was his visual image yeah. that he had of, of, of Tarzan. Yeah. And so he thought J. Allen St. John was number one, depicted Tarzan very uh, accurately. In, in, in. I think the, uh, you know, I mean, we all have our favorites or something like that, but. Uh, um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of different people did Tarzan, and they have different visions of him and stuff like that. But it's kind of interesting in terms of uh, the, um, the European training um, that J. Allen St. John had, and that he was so connected with um, what we you know, call the Art Academy. It's kind of interesting that he's bringing to it what we might say culturally, uh, like a weightiness which we associate, because we, as a former colony of Europe, uh, we look at uh, European art as being, you know, uh, something we aspire to, because we we're mere uh, rebels, and, you know, they were the actual king and the subjects of the king. And so I think um, at the turn of the century or something, that was very much alive, that sort of criteria. And um, so I would have to say that, you know, he brings a, 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 a gravitas to his portraits that are uh, definitely uh, what we we take our hat off to a lot and stuff like that. Um, I like the guy Hoban. Mm -hmm. um, Hoban, do you know his stuff? H O B A N. Yeah. And, uh, I like those a lot. I think they're really good. I like Clinton P T also. Um, um, but yeah, these are these are incredible. 
But I think the one of the things he has, uh, Jay on St. John, that other people don't have, is a kind of a Burroughs uh, a connection with the idea of um, imagination and, and inspiration, and kind of a because they're not quite academically right. There's something kind of <laughs> dreamy about them that are really neat. And you know, I was thinking of, like the impact of uh, culturally of someone like Frank Frazetta on our world, uh, you know, you can just show those images of Frazetta and, and you think that it's, you know, hearkening to an entire world of uh, um, literature that's, you know, really American and stuff. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't exist without J. Allen St. John. I don't think um, Frazetta would have um, come up with that incredible world of his own imagination. Um, if he, if he weren't looking at J. Allen St. John, and John has that weird kind of, uh, St. John has that kind of gravitas or something, but... Eh. I, I hate questions about who's the best of this or that, you know, because we all um, are totally, in, uh, have our own inspirations and we should totally follow them, uh, and it's, it's absurd to say which one is better than another, um, largely. But that's all I have to say. You got any more questions? Otherwise, I'll talk to you privately afterwards. But thank you very much. What can you do?